Well, it's a uh, Army Guard. This is a privilege for me to be here today. You can turn the top ones on. Uh, a privilege to be here today about my journey through War II. Uh, what I want to do is um, uh, take you for a walk from the time I was inducted until the time I was discharged. I'm terrific. Uh, first, before I start, I'd like to introduce my wife, Elaine, of 30, 52 years. Tonight, uh, my daughter and son will be here, but they couldn't make it today. Anyway, my journey uh, through World War I started right after high school. Graduated. I know you're old, but not that old. <laughs> I was a I was a, a local guy here. As a matter of fact, I was born less than a half a mile from here, down at Noble. But I didn't go too far. But anyway, I graduated from Noble High School in '43 and was uh, and volunteered to be drafted. In those days, you did that. And uh, I went into the service, and uh, I was inducted at Allentown. And I have a few things that's going to happen during this little journey that shows you how the government works and how we, a, a bright-eyed young guy of 19, began to see how the other world lives. I went to Allentown to be inducted, and uh, I sat down at this long table with a lot of officers there, and uh, this one man was the Air Corps man, and I, I, I wanted to volunteer for the Air Corps because I was a meteorologist student. I, I, my hobby is weather. One of my hobbies are weather, and I wanted to be a meteorologist. And uh, so I sat there, and he said, well, soldier, he said, what do you have in mind? I said, well, I'm going to join your Air Force. <laughs> he said, uh, I said, I'm a, I'm a weatherman. I'm going to be in your meteorology branch. He said, well, you're wearing glasses. And I said, uh, I, can see the, I can see this clouds, and I can see this guy. I, he, said, he said, you don't understand. He said, uh, unfortunately, for, to get in the Air Corps at this age, at this stage of the uh, war, you have to go in as a pilot and then flunk your way down to what you want to do. <laughs> I'm serious, that's exactly what he said. I said, you mean I can't get in because I, he said, that's right. So he said, he said you have to step over there and there was, a, it was like a cattle room. Guys like myself were standing in there wondering what's happening next. Then we got into a train and headed out west on a troop train. I got to St. Louis, we got sidetracked uh, pretty much all night, which was good because you could sleep. Next morning we headed uh, down south and we were wondering where we were headed for. You're, you're, one of a, you're one of many, it's like a bunch of lemmings. So we ended up at a place called Fort Sill. Well, Fort Sill is the uh, Field Artillery Training Replacement Center. It's a very beautiful old fort. That's back in the Apache days when that, uh, when that, was, uh, when that, when that began. But anyway, we got to Fort Sill and again we got off the train and we were herded into a big uh, post theater and they had various uh, sergeants and lieutenants uh, sitting there and they interviewed each one of us and the first thing the man said to me, he said, uh, you can just come over and sit by that table. He said, We're gonna, you're, you're going to be over there. What well, ended up, that because of my height, they put me in the mule skinners. <laughs> well, the mule skinners uh, is not particularly something I wanted to spend my time in the service doing. Uh, you're a mule packer. What you do, you haul artillery pieces and parts of artillery pieces around on the backs of mules and walk them over mountain ridges like in Burma or Italy. And I thought, this is not for me. Uh, first off, I, it, was, it, it was the truth. I was allergic to hay, hay fever. My eyes would water. My sister Betty had a uh, boarding, she boarded 12 horses back in the 30s. And I had the job with my brother to uh, clean the stables and maybe exercise them. And I hated it because I was always, looked like I was crying, had tears. So uh, I got to the uh, 26th Regiment, which was a mule skinners, and uh, got acquainted with the guys, and they're all pretty good sized guys, and I think, uh, how am I going to get out of this? I went to the Post Theater one night, I guess it was the next night or so forth, but I was sitting down with the rest of the GIs waiting for the show to start, and I struck up a conversation with a fellow beside me, and I said, uh, where are you? Where are you located? He says, oh, I'm in an observation battalion. I said, what are you, what's an observation today? He says, well, 
we are the eyes and ears of the artillery. He said, that's what I'm told. He said, I'm a dude like you. He said, they use weather, they use other things. And I heard him say weather. I said, weather? He said, yeah. I said, how did he use that? He says, I don't know. I just got here. So I found out where that, uh, that regiment was, the 8th Regiment. I found out where that uh, uh, office was. So I strolled over there the following day after duty hour, like five, and I introduced myself to the first sergeant. I never forgot his name, Sergeant Hunter. And I went in and sat down and introduced myself, and I said, I have a question. He said, yes, sir, soldier, what's that? He said, or I said, um, I'm a weather person. They had me in some other regiment here. There's no weather involved. I said, I, I study weather, and I want to be before, and I could, and I told him that, and he smiled. He said, well, what's a, what's a, a theatolite? I said, that's an instrument like a transit. It shows the ascent of a moon as it goes up, and it goes different directions, and it, you, you plot that course, and it shows you the wind direction at different altitudes. He said, that's right. He said, what's a psychrometer? So I told him what that was. He said, what's a dew point? I told him what it was. And I said, as a matter of fact, Sergeant, I walked over the door and I said, we have alto cumulus clouds out here right now. He says, well, he said, maybe we can use these. He said, where are you located? I said, I'm over at the 26th Regiment. He said, wait a minute. He said, that's a mule scooters. I said, that's right. He said, I can't get you out of that. Mm -hmm. I said, how come? He said, everybody who comes here and gets in the mule packers wants to get away. <laughs> everybody knows it. I said, well, <laughs> I said, uh, do what you can. He said, well, I don't promise a thing. Sunday morning, and I'm going to make this pretty quick, but Sunday morning uh, I was lying on my bunk on the second floor of the barracks, <coughs> contemplating my future. I heard the name, Morrison! Boy, I snapped too, and I went and ran to the top of the steps and looked down, here's Sergeant Hunter. He says, get your gear. Well, all my stuff was in a fuel, uh, foot locker. I ran that in my bag in about 60, 30 seconds sharp. I went down those steps, I never looked back, and I was into the observation battalion. I got out of the mule scooters. Then when I got into the observation battalion, I learned a week or two later that that's like getting into the fire. Because an observation battalion teaches you uh, locating uh, enemy artillery by flash and sound. But to do that, you also have to be on the outpost at the front line. See the target, relay it back to the fire direction center. And uh, I thought, well, here I am. So I made the best of it. So I went through basic. And uh, uh, went back to the East Coast here, going through the replacement centers, Fort Meade. I was there for about a week and a half. All the while we do this, you know, we train. We keep double timing and push-ups and running and so forth. Then we went up to Cape Miles Standish, which is up near Rhode Island. And the POE, the port of embarkation, was Boston. So uh, I got on board a, uh, a ship called the uh, Wakefield, a fairly good-sized ship. And we went across the Atlantic by ourselves. But in those days, I think the sub menace was pretty well uh, compromised. And, uh, and all the way across to uh, England and Liverpool, every seven minutes, we made a turn. That throws off any of the torpedoes that might be sighted at you. So uh, we, had a, we had a surprise one morning around 2.30. They called us to the top of the deck with all our gear on just to see if we knew how to do it. There's nothing but a Red Cross ship heading back to the States. We're very well lit up with a big red cross on the side, about a mile away. It was quite a thing to see. So we now arrive in England, at Liverpool, and we were trained by train down to uh, the Land's End down near uh, Barnstable. And they had a lot of uh, camps down there. And of course, I found out real fast that England was one massive airfield. Airports all over, bomber uh, locations. And we were down at the uh, Land's End for about a week. And then one day, we were, about 40 of us or so, were called out, got on a train, didn't know where we were going. We ended up near Oxford, which is about uh, 30 miles west of London. We got off the train at Oxford, and uh, we're all standing there, you know, with a bright eyed and bushy tail, wondering where we are and what's, who we're involved with. So all we saw standing around us were paratroopers, jump wings, jump hats, and then I heard, what's this? So we all just stood there because we we're there. And they said, welcome to the 101st Airborne Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, <laughs> one guy with a certain amount of gall said, well, wait a minute. We didn't volunteer. He says, you're in the glider outfit. You don't have to volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all, my, all my young days, I used to make model airplanes, the propeller job with a rubber band and all. I've made all kind of models. 
and I was a kind of aware and attuned to, to it flying, but uh, some of the boys were totally sick. They couldn't even think of flying, gliders or what have you. Anyway, we got on the, the, the big six by six trucks and rode back to the uh, camp, which was a horse farm. <laughs> now in England, during the war, uh, when you had the, the millions of the GIs that were over there, there, there aren't barracks. You're housed in barns, horse stalls, tents, and where my horse farm was, we were housed in, in old stables which were converted, and I didn't want to get into that because of the horse bed, but uh, I did get into a tent. And uh, so here we are, we were introduced to the 321st Glider Field Artillery Battalion, 101st Airborne. And uh, we were new replacements coming in to get on board with the main group who, was, who were yet to go to Normandy. We didn't know when that would happen. And uh, so we learned our job. My particular job was uh, a, a survey and instrument man, and also, of course, uh, an observer, Ford observer. Now, they had about nine teams, Ford observation teams, which are made up of a, uh, an officer, a sergeant, a radio man, and a jeep driver. So I'm new on a block, so I was not involved with any of that yet. I had to kind of work my way into it. Not that I was in a big hurry to do that. So uh, let's have the first. Uh, <coughs> Now let me just tell you a little bit about what we have here. Of course, you all know, those of you know, this is a C-47, the C-3, and then configuration military-wise was C-47. That had two 1,200 horsepower engines and was a real workhorse in World War II. This is a CG-4A glider. That stands for Cargo Glider Model 4A. That weighs approximately 3,500 pounds empty and it can haul up to 7,000 pounds in flight with full equipment. And I just wanted to let you know that. And I, I have a couple of models. And I'll refer to these a few times, but I just want to let you know, with that light on, uh, these are models I made. These are actually two scale to each other. The wingspan of this CG4A is 84 feet. The wingspan of a C-47 is about 88 feet, so they're really very close this way. Now, being towed, you have a 300-foot nylon, uh, nylon line coming from the C-47 up to here, and I'm going to approximate that's about 300 feet. Now, that cord, or that the line is three-quarters of an inch in diameter. It's 300 feet long, but when this takes off with this load behind it, there's a stretch factor of 15%. So that 300 feet then goes to 345 feet. That's how long that tow line is. And it's towed, the line is attached to the top of the glider cockpit right, right about there. So this is how it looks in, 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 in flight, just about like that. I'm going to refer to this a little later. Okay. Uh. <coughs> These CG4A gliders, they can hold a 75-pack howitzer, which I'll show you in a few minutes. Here's another type of a gun. That's an anti-tank gun. It'll also hold a Jeep. It'll also hold a Jeep trailer. This is with equipment and loaded. It also can take, without equipment, it can take 12 soldiers plus the pilot and co-pilot. Now there's a there's a cable inside the top which goes back to this to the back of the glider and it keeps that nose up. But uh, going to Holland, I'll tell you about another episode where we had a I had an episode with that with that the top of that glider nose. Uh, next, uh, that's a picture I took uh, after the war was over. Hitler's heading, <laughs> but this is our 75 howitzer. This is the airborne howitzer brought in by parachute and or glider. The 75 uh, millimeter, roughly just a little under three inch diameter. And that has a, that, they are very accurate. It's a small gun, but I mean, we call them pea shooters, affectionately pea shooters, but it was a very accurate uh, gun uh, for 3,000, uh, three and a half miles to five miles at the most. And uh, that of course is in a glider. Everything is lashed down in the glider. And um, I just wanted to let you know what one of these things look like. Now, Ed Benneke, who, who spoke to you back in August, he was in the uh, 377th the Parachute Field Artillery Battalion. Now, they jump in combat, they take their glider, they take the gun apart in seven particular packages. 
seven parachutes comprises one gun. So what normally is, uh, they jumped at nighttime and they couldn't find any more than one total gun. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. The advantage of a glider is when you get in combat with a glider, the, 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 assuming the glider gets there in one piece, you have the gun ready to go. And that's really the way to do it. Next, uh, this is a picture I took uh, in, in England. That's out of our glider. I thought it was a rather interesting uh, composition, so I took it at the moment and it worked out fine. This shows the, uh, the glider <coughs> on tow. This was a double tow where they had two gliders behind one C-47. These were empty, they didn't have any uh, equipment in, just men. I think we have one more, Brandon? Okay, we'll hold that one right there. The idea of an airborne mission is to uh, get in quick, do your job, and get out as quick as possible. Uh, when you go in airborne, you're jumping in enemy territory, that shows what they have waiting for you. Tanks, uh, what, uh, you have no idea. But you jump in, and the idea is to get in and get out quick. And uh, we had a few episodes later in our life over there where we stayed in really too long. But I just wanted to let you know about the idea of, a, of, a, of an airborne mission. And my job, of course, was a surveyor and observer. Uh, we were getting close to uh, the end of May, and uh, there were rumors that things were happening. As it turned out, uh, the D-Day was supposed to be in June 4th or June 5th. Uh, but before that, we all went to staging areas, and uh, this probably doesn't mean anything. I can't even see that. We went into staging areas. The uh, paratroops uh, were taking off from all these airports here. And by the way, I'm going to take just a moment. Uh, I'd like to have two gentlemen get up here. Jack. And Herb, would you stand up? Come up here. This is Jack Agnew, Herb Pierce. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> These people are shy. <laughs> Any of you folks ever hear of the Dirty Dozen? Yeah. You have. There is a, a dozen. Here are two of the Dirty Dozen. I can't tell them everything. No, but these guys, uh, among all the other regiments and the other divisions, the 82nd, 101st, and the British 6th, uh, they went in Normandy at uh, just a little bit after midnight. But Herb and uh, Jack and all their associates jumped to from, what, 12.30 uh, a.m.? Gone, 12.30. And uh, these, these both fellows were in the demolition platoon. And uh, the whole idea of this airborne mission in, uh, in Normandy was to uh, uh, cause havoc. But I just first wanted to meet you, uh, have you meet them. Now, being the Dirty Dozen, they also dressed accordingly. Uh, they had Indian haircuts, Indian paint on their faces, and they were pretty rugged looking, motley looking crew guys. <laughs> that, but they were great, they did their job. And I mean, they had a heck of a job to do. I'll tell you one thing about paratroops. Thanks very much. Thank you. Those uh, paratroopers, I'm going back, uh, going back maybe uh, just uh, for a moment. Paratroopers that were trained in the United States before they went over to Europe or the Pacific. Uh, they are not like the paratroopers that they taught after the war and taught them in Europe. These guys were all volunteers, and let's just use a round number. Let's just say there were a thousand of them who went to Fort Benning and Toccoa or Fort Bragg. Out of those thousand, with all that severe uh, athletic work they had to do, the training, the uh, physical fitness they had to do, around 400 didn't make it. These are the pick of the crop, and from what I know how they trained, I put them on the same par, maybe a notch below, as our U.S. Rangers who were tops. These guys were just like them. So consider that when you think of a paratrooper of World War II who was, who was actually trained in the States. Am I correct on that, Jack? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack just said that uh, uh, they're notch above them. <laughs> well, they were all great. They did a great job. And I'll tell you, when, uh, anyway, I'm getting, getting, uh, getting away from my discussion. So all the... Uh, all the units went to the airports to get ready for what 
whatever they were going to do. June, we were down at, um, I don't much region, uh, Cardiff. Uh, we went in, the, our glider outfit didn't go into Normandy on gliders, thank goodness, because they didn't have enough gliders. But um, uh, we actually left our whole unit was down in this area somewhere, some camp. But essentially, we, uh, our seaborne element left Cardiff and went on down around here and just kind of waited and uh, waited for the, for the word. Eisenhower had to uh, put off the D-Day from June 5th because of heavy winds and storms. Whether people said uh, June 6th looked good. So uh, he uh, flipped the coin, I guess, in his mind, and he figured, let's go on June 6th. So uh, away they went. Uh, he was at the, Eisenhower came to the 101st Airport, and I don't know what airport that was, but he introduced, or interviewed quite a few of the men. He wished them good luck, and um, they took off. June 5th, uh, around, what, 10, 11 o'clock at night, before midnight, because they had to fly. Now, what happened there, uh, the target was um, right here. This is, this is the Sherburne Peninsula right here. They flew down here, did a 90 left, and came on this way. The 101st came down a little bit more this way. They flew right across the peninsula from the southwest to the northeast. Seaborne element came in here. Our group landed at uh, Utah Beach. Omaha Beach was right here. Gold, uh, Gold, Sword, and Juno were down here. The Brits landed here. Parachutes landed here. The parachutists. The 82nd, 101st landed right here. Uh, next, uh, okay, that's a little bit better. Okay. When they jumped into Normandy, uh, the job of Jack. I don't, were you on the? Were you also a, a pathfinder? Okay, Jack was a pathfinder. A pathfinder is a. Not, not yet. Not yet. Oh. Anyway, uh, pathfinders jump in prior to the main element, the main elements of the the whole armada, and they uh, they show beacons and devices on the ground, lights to show the incoming flights that they're on course and where they should drop their men. Uh, there was some bad luck, unfortunately, that night because even though some of the areas were easily visible because we, there was, a, I think, a half moon and uh, the weather was good. Also, in areas, there was a lot of clouds and severe clouds and the, and the C-47 pilots got lost. Mm. Essentially, what happened, they deposited the airborne people in areas all over because they didn't know where they were, the clouds. And, of course, they were, that was their first mission. And when you're in your first mission in combat, there's some stress. But the point is, the jumpers all landed all over this area. And uh, St. Mary Glees was one place that's kind of well known because of some of the activity there. But uh, what happened when these jumpers, when these skydiv skydivers, when these uh, paratroopers landed, they raised holy hell with the Germans. So the Germans had no idea where they were, how many they were. And the, it was just pandemonium. But all the guys, the 82nd, 101st, they kind of lingered together because they, they, they landed near each other. And uh, it took a while to get that sorted out, but they did take their objectives, which were causeways coming in from Utah Beach because of the, our mission was here, open causeways and roads in, and also to uh, uh, knock off some of the uh, cannons and the uh, artillery and what have you, aiming out the uh, channel. The, um, Seaborne element was coming in. Uh, the ship I was on was called the uh, Susan B. Anthony. It struck a magnetic mine, uh, D-Day, late D-Day afternoon, and uh, it slowly sank, everybody got off. I cringed at that because the food on that thing was fantastic. <laughs> and, and the ice cream and all that, that food, and like that's gonna go down. But that's, that's the way it is. Uh, so we didn't get into, we didn't essentially get to Utah Beach Shore until late that night, early, June, June 7th morning. Um, and then our, our equipment was on another ship because we were on a personnel uh, ship. We had another ship, an LST, that carried our trucks, our artillery and everything. They couldn't find it. It was out in the channel. They couldn't find it. The Beachmaster did finally find it uh, the following night. And uh, you have no idea of the traffic out in that channel when this thing was going on. Uh, but we got together, and essentially the, uh, the biggest uh, objective in, in, uh, in this peninsula here was Normandy, or the Carentan was the, uh, 
probably the largest uh, town, and it wasn't a big town that the, uh, the airborne took. And we relieved uh, other people in that area, and uh, we stayed there until the about the 20th of June. And uh, essentially, essentially uh, I forget some of the other things. It's a, it's a fog in my mind. But we didn't do much combat after that. We did fire for VEC for uh, uh, some missions uh, with ground forces. And our Normandy mission was over on June or July 12th. We all went to Utah Beach and uh, back to England. We went on LSTs. And I never was on an LST before. But uh, I'll tell you, I, that, that thing is a flat bottom boat and the depth rock. I mean, it really rocked. I, I'm a guy that didn't get seasick, but a whole lot of people were. We got back to England and we got back to our base and we came back to the horse farm. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so we got back to the horse farm and uh, in, in that time of uh, six weeks in Normandy, uh, we made good friends with the regular uh, original men, burned uh, quite a bit of our job. <coughs> And uh, one thing about Normandy, I just want to backtrack a minute, the French people, the farmers, uh, they were really neat farming people. Uh, I was amazed. Uh, one time I was on an ammo run from our area back down to Utah Beach to pick up ammo in a, in a big army truck. We had about three trucks that went down for rations, ammo, and uh, uh, when, when we sat, in, uh, pardon me, when we sat the um, trucks waiting to go down to the beach, constant traffic coming up the various college causeways and the roads uh, it never stopped I mean there was huge equipment there were one five hive howitzers there were tanks there were half track and the French people standing along the road kind of like this where they always have their cigarette in their mouth but they were staying there they, they just looked almost in awe wondering where the stuff came from and the expressions on their face were it was unique and uh, I never forgot that the other and uh, some of the other folks in the Normandy, like in Caen and St. Lo, they went through a terrible time. They got bombed by our, our planes. They got uh, shelled by the Germans, and a lot of French people died. But you know, that's the, that's the way it was. We got back to England, and uh, we discovered that um, the Germans had come up with a weapon called the V1. And that was a jet-propelled uh, wing, winged aircraft. Uh, it was nothing more than a bomb. Had a jet on top, had a wing, and those guys had that figured out to fly across the channel, aimed it with a certain amount of fuel, so the fuel went out went near London, and down it went. And uh, so that was the first uh, uh, secret weapon quote that we uh, that we saw. Up where our horse farm was, uh, I never we never had any land near us, even though we were about 35 miles west of London, the proposed target. But there were some nights I could hear that ta 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 pretty far away. But I never, we had never had one near us. Back in England, we uh, did some training. We got new men, got new equipment, uh, got set for whatever came next. I was on a field trip one day. <laughs> There's young Tom <laughs> in his formal year. I was in the, on a field trip one day. Uh, it was, I guess it was about a two-day trip, and uh, <clears throat> I saw in the distance about a mile. It looked like a plane, but it was going totally too fast to be a plane and it made a tremendous racket and I thought could that be a buzz bomb so I put my binoculars right on it and it wasn't it was a plane but it was going so fast that it was just not possible you know you're all we're used to is propellers I didn't know it until the end of the war I found out that it was an experimental British jet called the Gloucester Meteor and that was something to see and it made a tremendous racket the jet engine was really noisy so that's another one of my new things that in your young life you uh, you, you, you uh, discovered the, uh, after we got our training and our uh, new equipment in, uh, as I said before, an airborne mission is to be going quick and get out. Uh, there were dry runs. A dry run is where there's a proposed mission in the works, but it's not signed and ready to go yet. But when you get into a dry run like this, the whole unit goes to the airport. And you're in tents, and you wait. You're in a hangar, you wait, you get fed. Uh, very good food. The Air Force does great. The um, uh, the um, time might be two or three days. We're in the staging area, getting ready for what's coming next. Uh, we had one dry run around August 20th. And that was to go to the southwestern edge of uh, Paris. 
And uh, we were pretty close to doing that. But suddenly it so happens that uh, Georgie Patton got there a little bit quicker than they thought. And so that was erased. That was deleted, deleted, back to the horse farm we go. And uh, of course, when you're back there, all you do is double time, always doing physical things, hikes, what have you. Uh, then we had another uh, dry run. That dry run was a place called Tournai, Belgium. That was just north of France in the Belgian area, just across the border in Belgium. Well, that was the British sector, and they don't move too quick. But it so happens that uh, we were all set to go on that, and uh, Montgomery surprised us, and uh, the, the Brits went beyond that, so we back to the horse farm. And uh, there we were again. That was, I think, around uh, the last uh, week or first week of September. Then we got word again that there's another dry run. So we go to the airport. And when you go, you don't know whether you're really gonna go. So we went to the airport, and uh, I, you can erase that. <laughs> and um, that, that was the staging area. I was at Aldermaston uh, Airport, and we had gliders that are lined up on a runway right behind the C-47s. And as far as the eye could see, you could see C-47s and gliders. And in front of every glider, uh, the 300-foot tone line was S like that, right up to the tail of the C-47. And uh, so we watched all this, and we loaded, the, we loaded the gliders with equipment, and we were all set to go, and we just waited until the, we got the green light. Well, September 17th, 1944, we got the green light, like the night before. Uh, this was Operation Market Garden. You might have uh, heard of that one. Uh, Cornelius Ryan wrote a book sometime after the war, around 1970, about a bridge too far. Uh, Don, may I borrow you a minute? Can you turn this front light on? Yep. No I just, if you don't mind, just hold this up. <laughs> now, uh, unfortunately, we couldn't put this on the screen because it's too big and original. I drew that years ago, and I gave a talk about this to some some group. But this is uh, this is Holland, Netherlands, all the way up to here. This is a border of Belgium. Can you see that in the back? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, it's not big. But this bottom line is the uh, Belgian-Dutch border, and right here, this red line was the uh, main line of resistance at that point on the ground. In other words, this is all German-held territory. The British uh, 30th uh, Corps was poised here from Brussels to shoot up here when they got the green light and when we were going in. Uh, Holland. Uh, the idea here, you have to understand that Holland uh, is laced with canals and waterways. And uh, the object of the Airborne was to take all these bridges. Well, our target here was Eindhoven, a fairly large city. Have you ever heard of Phillips, North American Phillips or Phillips of Eindhoven? That's where they're located. Uh, this is Eindhoven. Our drop zone where I land was right here at Zahn. There's other drop zones here, Beppel, and then on up. And the 82nd Airborne landed in this area right here. And their big target was the Nijmegen Bridge, about the size of the Coney Parmeyer Bridge, a very important bridge. And uh, that was their objective, plus a few other bridges here. And the British First Division landed up here above Arnhem. Here's Arnhem right here. And they landed about seven miles northwest of Arnhem. And they had to fight their way back to uh, this area here. So if you all have a picture of this, I'm gonna put this down. But first, I want you to know that uh, it's, it's really, it's almost a disaster in, in, the, in waiting here. When you launch three airborne divisions in an area 60 miles, 69 miles long, and this is German territory, and they have tanks, and, they have, and we don't have tanks. We were depending on the Brits to come up here with their armor and all and their trucks, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So I wanna, I wanna just talk about that a little bit. Everybody finish looking at this? Okay, you can dial something like this. So, oh, by the way, any questions, I want you to wait until after the, uh, my presentation. So when you go in up there, uh, you're, you're, you're launching into an area where uh, you have no idea what's waiting for you. Oh, I want to get back to that again. Picture. I want to, I want to show you something. Come over here, man. 
This is important. <laughs> I know this. all these lines uh, kind of run together, but this is as far as, um, as Montgomery went, and he stopped right here. Uh, all he had to do was go a little bit further to here. The whole 15th German army was poised, uh, I'm sorry, it's right here. The whole 15th German army was poised right here because down here is Antwerp, and they knew that the Allies needed this port to get their equipment and supplies. If only Montgomery would have gone up here and closed off this neck and, and stopped right here, but no, he stopped here. So the Germans weren't dumb. They figured, well, our time is numbered here because the whole Allied front was pushing. So the whole 15th German army escaped from here unscathed, and we met them right up here at Zahn, place of St. Louis, and a place called Best, a very bad battle at Best. So I just want you to know that's one of the faux pas of uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. Up at Arnhem, the, uh, the Dutch underground told the Brits before the invasion, uh, the Dutch underground said, uh, we don't we don't uh, we don't suggest you do this and the Brits said well we have uh, aerial photography aerial uh, observation that there, there's no great amount of German equipment there and, and uh, the Dutch uh, back the Dutch underground said well we don't know where you got your information but there are two German panzer divisions bivouacked just northwest of Arnhem northwest is where they're going to jump and land and the Brits says, well, we're going to have a go at it because our, our planes don't show that. Well, the Germans are great at camouflage. They had two Panzer divisions there. They were bivouac, they were building new equipment, and they were there. That's why the whole thing failed. But uh, anyway, we did fly into the uh, day 101st, went up, jumped in uh, my glider ride, going across the channel. It was uh, something to behold. Uh, first off, D-Day for that was September 17th. Uh, the artillery didn't go in, wasn't planned to go in until the following day. Uh, when the airborne did go in on September 17th, they had absolutely perfect weather. It was a parade, uh, parade ground exercise. It was just great. The weather was great. The drop zones were, were great, and the Germans were surprised. Following that invasion, the Germans know, well, there's more coming tomorrow, and they were all set up for us. Well, the next day, it was very foggy in, 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 uh, across the channel and in England. And we, the fog didn't lift until after 2 p.m. Well, you can't take off at 2 p.m. to go that distance and, and do your job. So we put it off until the next day, September 19th, Tuesday. And that's the day we took off in our gliders. Uh, we were flying after we took off. We were flying around England in circles, getting the whole armada together, and the people in the, in the down in the villages were out there <coughs> waving, waving their coats, and it was just great to see that. And here we were going across the channel, and the weather was supposed to have been clear, but uh, where I was, it wasn't. We went over the channel, and uh, again, keep in mind that there's 300 feet. I'll do it this way so you can see it. There's 300 feet between that glider and that plane. And I was in an armada where my uh, my, uh, my flight, I was, I think, last in that whole column that I was in, my glider was the last one, and I thought, that's a bad spot to be in, because then you get a lot of concentrated fire. But we, we left and uh, got in over the channel and got into this zero, zero uh, visibility condition. You're in big, massive clouds, and I'm watching the front of my, I'm always watching the front of the cockpit, and the tow line went right around the front of the glider down this way, which meant my pilot was way up here because you know, he's not he's not instrument rated to the point of knowing where he is. He did a great job of finding his way back down, but my mind was, where are all the other planes and gliders? Are they doing this too? And I was waiting for another uh, C-47 or something to chop our wing with a prop. Who knows, but we were way up here and all the other gliders had to be in the same predicament. And we got back down, and that was a that was a stressful uh, half hour. When we got into the near the drop zone, the altitude lowered. I think it was around 800 feet preparation for landing, and um, for about 20 minutes we flew over concentrated fire from the ground from the Germans, 
because the Brits did not go up where they were supposed to go. They were they had a terrible time getting up there. So we were flying over German territory for close to 20 minutes. Slugs were coming through the wing, <coughs> through the wing. And my glider had a 37 uh, millimeter uh, mortar uh, two-wheeled cart lashed down, and the fuses weren't in, but they were there right at my at our knees. And this thing, we were sitting there, and this thing had to be this high, and had mortars in there. And uh, I looked at that and I thought, wow. That slug did come through the composite plywood base of the glider. It missed people and it missed that thing. Other slugs came through here, back here, and uh, but this is all fabric and uh, aluminum tubing. And then the, the, uh, the floor of the glider is a composite. Uh, and of course, you have the wheels on for takeoff. Those wheels are strictly for takeoff. When we landed, and before we landed, uh, they unhooked it about 800 feet. And then the glider then is on its own and the glider pop looking on the ground for a place to land. Well, the ground is loaded with other gliders, crashed C-47s, and men and equipment down there, and my glider pile's looking for a place to land. Well, he finds a slot right down here, and I'm looking, and by the way, <laughs> I'm sitting on my field pack because slugs are coming up, and that when, when you're in combat, there's two things you protect. The first is your head. The next is your crotch. <laughs> and that's the order. I had the helmet on, but that helmet is, uh, it's, 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 you should have sat it, but, but I was on my full field pack. But anyway, I clicked through that off and got myself bracketed in my uh, seatbelt, and my pilot was going down like that. And just out of nowhere, another pilot, and in light conditions over here, he sees a landing spot here, and it's like this. Uh, we, we had a glider go right across our nose, I think only about 150 feet in front of us. He found the slot there, and this glider pilot saw the slot here, and it's this kind of a thing. Uh, and there were some air-to-air -air accidents there, which are pretty severe. So uh, when I got on the ground, I decided that I'm going to have to volunteer for jump school. I don't want any more of that. <laughs> and that's the truth. When we did land, uh, it's sandy soil, farm country. The wheels popped off, and the bottom of the glider has uh, plywood skids. They're like real thick, heavy skis. They're about that thick of plywood, and they're quite long with a little bit of a nose up like that in the front, and we skidded, and the glider, the glider hit the ground. The wheels flew off, and it went, went across the ground like this. It went up on his nose, came down, I thought I broke my back. So we quick get out of there because we don't know what's happening. There's artillery and there's all kind of noise. And, I, and my job uh, when we got out of the uh, glider was to hold up the nose with the two other fellows. And we held up the nose like you saw that one shot. Here's, a, here's, a, here's what happens. I think another glider must have hit this midship like that. But they do come apart. Now uh, my job. You know, that one shot you saw way back there in England where I had the nose up and we were putting that gun in, uh, they always pick tall guys to hold up the nose like that. And as I'm doing this, our glider pilot, for some reason or other, was a, was a, was a, had a 45 Thompson submachine gun as his equipment. Now he's a pilot. He's not, a, he's not an airborne fighter. But they gave him guns. They gave him different guns. And he had a 45 caliber Tommy gun. He got out of the glider. And he was behind me. I'm, not, I'm like this. And the fellow was here. He put his gun down. It wasn't on safety. He had his finger, the dummy, he had his finger in the trigger guard. And as he put it down, it went off. And the concussion in your head, in your ear, that close, there was a concussion. And I'm holding his glider thing up, the uh, nose up like this. This gun's going off, and it's, it's wild. It's going like that. And as I'm holding this up, I feel the, I feel the cockpit moving. I feel things. A lot of those slugs that were, were going off are going right through the nose that I'm holding up. So one of the sergeants quick grabbed it, grabbed the, no the no nozzle, hold it up, and took it away from me, and put it down. And I didn't move a bit. I just held it up <laughs> until they got that uh, mortar ammo out. I mean, after, in, in a matter of an hour and a half, there were two things that, that uh, decided me to never, never go on the glider again. <laughs> I'll tell you. Now the, uh, 
the, the Dutch people, I mean, our first objective, by the way, was the big city of Eindhoven and the 506th Regiment, which is Herb and Jack's outfit, uh, were part of the group who actually took the town of Eindhoven first. And then we had a uh, we had a canal bridge that the Germans blew just as we got to it. And the, uh, the British engineers rebuilt that very quickly. And all the way up, of course, the object was to uh, get these bridges so that the British ground forces could hurry up and get up to Arnhem where their men were. And uh, their men in Arnhem were going through a hell of a time. They were just, their radios didn't work. It was just unbelievable how that whole thing was fouled up. Uh, the Dutch reception, the people were fantastic. We had farmers out there with their big old two-wheeled carts with a horse coming out to see if they could help us. Well, they were in the way. But we didn't want them to know that they were in the way because we had our jeeps and our trailers and we had all our equipment. We didn't have any trucks, of course. But they wanted to help us, so we let them help. And uh, the people were just great. Uh, there were times we were walking uh, up the corridor, up that road. Uh, the people along the roads were out there waving and shaking, you know, wanted to shake your hand. They would give us plums. They had no food to speak of. They had a terrible time under German occupation. But they gave us uh, beets, uh, they gave us uh, plums, and I took a lot of them because I loved them. And uh, they gave us milk. It was all warm milk, but that's the way they do it in Holland. They don't have cold milk like we do. Uh, but uh, the people were fantastic. They just, and out came the orange flags, the, uh, the Dutch flag, a lot of orange, orange, uh, what do you call those little tassels that come off. And they, they were just great, and I never forgot that. We had a lot of very severe battles going up that corridor toward Arnhem, and uh, eventually uh, my unit, 101st, moved up to an area just south of Arnhem, and we were there for about uh, three or four weeks. Now, talking about an airborne mission where you're supposed to be in and out quick, we were in Holland for 78 days, which is not the way it's designed. But Montgomery's idea was to grab all these bridges and open up the highway into North Jersey to get to Berlin. It was a very bold idea, but uh, logistically, I think it was a terrible mistake. Anyway, we lost a lot of good men. The Brits lost uh, three-fourths of their first airborne division, and uh, it was just uh, it was just a debacle, a debacle of what happened there. Uh, while I was in Holland, a little, a little side there, uh, one night it was very clear in about twilight, and I'm always looking up in the sky for things. I saw a flare. Now, in the, in the army, in, in combat, both sides throw up in the flare with a parachute and down it comes very slowly and really lights up the territory. <coughs> you can see what's happening over there. The flares come down. I saw in the distance, and it looked like it was quite far away, but here's this flare going up. And I looked at that, watching it. There was another fellow from, with me from uh, Pittsburgh. I said, hey, Al. I said, look at that flare. It's going the wrong way. And we looked at it. It went up and up in the angled south westerly direction. It kept going, I'd say, for at least uh, 30, 45, maybe a minute. It got dimmer and dimmer. Didn't see it anymore. I thought, what's happening? Two days later, I'm looking in the same general direction, and I see two columns of smoke going up. And as the smoke goes up, I saw a flare or a flame under. And then as the, as the higher they got, the column of air, <laughs> turns that column this way, you know, how that, how that zigzags. And these two things were going up, and I thought, what could that be? And uh, later on, we found out, uh, like a, about a week later, we got the newspaper, the Stars and Stripes. Churchill admitted that the Germans were launching V-2s, rockets, from somewhere in North Europe, hitting, hitting London. <coughs> They're going a five-minute flight from, from Europe to London. I thought, it's not possible. You know, me again, 20 years old. Nothing's going, nothing can go that fast. I said, that's not possible. They said, they're rockets. I told my captain, I said, hey, captain, I said, I have an idea. No one knows where these are. I saw them, and I said, a lot of our people saw them. Why don't we do this with instruments? Every mile and a half to two miles, put an instrument there with a, with a knowledgeable man behind it, and just sit there and watch for the next rocket that goes off. When it goes off, strike an azimuth where it was, and then the simple thing of triangulation. He says, good idea, Morrison. We heard another thing. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, as it turned out, and I'm going to drift on here, 
as it turns out, uh, there was a, one, uh, uh, Holland is directly east of, of England, and of course right next door is North Germany. And the bombing runs over there. Huge formations of bombers were always something we, we, we saw, we heard. Uh, then the fighter planes from England come over, and like the Spitfires and the P-51s and the other ones, they fly cover, and then they have to come back. It only goes so far. And one day, a bunch of uh, Spitfires or Hurricanes are coming back on a, on a on a fighter mission, coming back. And as they were flying along and north, going through North uh, Holland, uh, this fighter plane saw something like a telephone pole going up like that right beside him. You figure that's a rocket, and they, you can see the. Uh, so he flew the whole flight around, and they zeroed in on where that took off from. They got a, they got a, uh, an azimuth, they got a, uh, not an azimuth, they got the co coordinates. And they flew back and told the people in the English, uh, here in England, where this uh, launch point was. They came back the next day with, with the uh, Mosquito. That's that wooden, fast fighter bomber. They came back to that very spot, but there's nothing on the ground. It so happens the Germans had mobile launching pads, so. Uh, so they found out, though, that they took off from Holland. So that was a big thing there. We ended up the, uh, our, our journey in Holland up near, uh, up near Arn, and it was kind of a static situation then. And uh, we pulled out of Holland uh, November 28th, right after Thanksgiving, drove back, to, uh, drove back to France to a place called Mormelan. It's right near Reims. You may, you may have heard of Reims. That's where the surrender was signed. And uh, we got back there, and... We had to make up new equipment. It's winter time. We had to get new supplies in. We had to get new, uh, new men, of course. And a lot of guys went on passes to uh, London, Paris. And uh, we were there for about three weeks. And suddenly, on December 16th, the Battle of the Bulge started. It was a big offensive from the uh, Eiffel mountain range of the Ardennes, eastern Belgium. And uh, it was about 80 miles long. The Germans drove through very quickly. They went through two green outfits who were just put there just to give them some time in, in the, on the front. And uh, they just mince, made mincemeat of them. And suddenly, uh, Schaeff, which is Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, Schaeff decided that this is very serious. They pulled out everybody they could and put them up in the front you know, on, the, on that, on that uh, front. The 82nd and 101st were the only reserve units they had, and they were, we were only back for three weeks. But they put us up there in trucks. We drove all night on the 18th to Bastogne. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we were down, we were down in here. But this is, uh, I'm gonna refer to this again later. Uh, this was the extent, the bulge started right here. This is where the front line was on December 18th, or December 16th. They launched us right through the mountains here. The mountains were somewhat like the foothills of the Poconos, strip, you know, patches of woods and so forth, and hills, not steep hills, but they were like this. Bastogne was very important, and St. Vit was very important because these roads intersected right here. There were eight roads that came into Bastogne, which the Germans had to have, and there were five roads that came into St. Vit, which the Germans had to have to go. Their target was Antwerp. They wanted to get to Antwerp. And they relied on capturing a lot of American Allied fuel dumps to keep going because they, they could only haul so much. Now, Bastogne uh, was the uh, area where we drove up and the 101st moved in here on the night of the 18th and December 19th in the morning. The Germans were only two miles from here. Two miles. Now, I don't, I don't know that much about the same bit. I can tell you what we experienced here in Bastogne. Unfortunately, St. Vith did collapse and go, but they, they held out for a terrific long time, and those guys really deserve what they <coughs> deserve all the accolades that, that's possible. Now, our people right here at Bastogne uh, went out on roadblocks, slowed the Germans down, and as we drove into Bastogne early that morning, there were hundreds of stragglers heading southeast. These are guys on feet on foot, on jeeps. Here, we're going in to plug this thing, and all of our, our allied soldiers, our other army guys, are going the other way. And we said, that doesn't make sense. Remember that? Remember that, Jack? 
Herb? Oh, you flew it. Okay. But anyway, a bunch of stragglers from the from stragglers that were fear. They were scared to death of all this coming. They just took off. That green outfit, the 106th Infantry Division, they went through here and they kept going. They wanted to get away. They don't want to get anywhere near that. So, um, so our our division went to work there. McAuliffe, General McAuliffe, um, who was the uh, uh, Brigadier General, he was he was the uh, second in command of the division. General Taylor was in the states doing some staff meetings. So McAuliffe was our commander at Bastogne, and uh, he put roadblocks out at, at, at the important where they had to be, and uh, all through here. And Herbie's at, you weren't, were you at the Bastogne, Herb? No. Oh, okay. Anyway, we were stationed right up in here, and I'll show you that. But uh, the artillery units were dug in, and uh, the Germans were coming. Can I see you first time? Okay. Here's what it looked like. Roadblocks <coughs> were here, and up here, and in this area right here. The Germans were pushing, they got this close. Now, we're only talking like two miles from past time right here. They got that close, and they hit those roadblocks, and they were surprised because they had it so easy further back. So this, this concentration of power that the Germans had they started to go around us and go around us. At the same time, they're still punching in. They punched through here and on down to this town of Poi. I pushed that way, and the, much of the German armor went on around. They had Panzer divisions galore. They had Wolf's Grenadier divisions. And uh, can I have the next map? Okay, this is 21st. You see how they went around? They're pushing in. Our division, with some stragglers, and we also had uh, some uh, 10th Armored Division tanks there that were that were kept from going any further. They stayed with us. And we also had a uh, 705 Tank Destroyer Battalion that was kept with us. We grabbed all these and wouldn't let them go, and they stayed with us. So we had minimal tanks. We had some uh, high-powered anti-tank equipment. At the same time, the Germans kept going around us, and they're pushing in. All the while they're pushing this way, they're pushing in this way. They're getting closer to us. My uh, artillery battalion was dug in right about, right in this area right here. Ed fell on the back there, my other friend. <coughs> we were both pretty much together right here. Okay, that's how the another, next map. Okay, this is a 22nd. This is a battle here. This day, this closed up, and we were, essentially we were surrounded. And that's, uh, that's when that encirclement was completed. Uh, that day also was the first day we had sunny weather because it was all cloudy and bad weather before because our air corps couldn't get in there to help. Now it's clear and did they go to work around us. But we were surrounded. Uh, that day on the 22nd, the German uh, officer came in with, under a flag of truce and he met uh, one of our colonels right here in this area. And, uh, he was uh, taken into uh, Warren had this all, all, they had this surrender document which uh, was taken to General McAuliffe in the headquarters. General McAuliffe got this uh, directive from the German which said we, we want you to surrender within two hours. If you don't do that, we will obliterate the town and all the Allied soldiers will obliterate that and all those civilian losses will be on your shoulder. So uh, when they got that, when McAuliffe got that, he said, oh, I'm nuts. And uh, they said, well, we gotta, we got to answer him. And one of our men uh, said, uh, General, what you just said is all you need. The general said, what I say? He said, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Oh. Pardon? Yeah. So General McAuliffe said, what did I say? And this uh, fellow, this major said, you said nuts. So they scribbled nuts right across the, uh, the document, gave it to the uh, infantry uh, colonel who was in that sector. He took it back to the German. The German officer, uh, waited for the answer. He said, what's the answer? The general says, here's the answer. So uh, the German officer looked at it. He says, what's this? What's that mean? He said, it's uh, nuts. <laughs> well, he said, what's this? Colonel said, it means to go to hell. <laughs> and the sooner you guys surrendered us, the better it'll be for all of us. So off he went. 
And that was the end of that. Two hours later, it was as quiet as it was two hours before. It was all bluff. But that was the story of the, uh, the nuts uh, surrender that you probably he heard about. Aerial resupply. We got aerial resupply. Here it is. This was like manna from heaven. These guys put themselves in very bad condition here. They're only 400 feet up, 500 feet up. This is our parachute supplies coming in with medical supplies, ammo, food. The Germans didn't know, but we were down to like one, two, <coughs> one high explosive shell with about 10 smoke shells. We were firing smoke shells for effect and only high explosive shells, only when we could get a big group of Germans to shoot at. So that's how low we were, but they didn't know that. So here's the aerial resupply. We had that on the 22nd, the 23rd, the 24th, Christmas Day, the 25th, and the 26th. But these, this is what held us together. Um, let's see, I wanna go to the next one. Okay, now they're getting closer. They're furious because we didn't give up. We're pushing closer. Here's Bastogne. There was one time they were only like 300 yards from the outskirts of the houses at Bastogne. And I'll tell you, the, uh, these, these, this airborne group of the 101st uh, did a phenomenal job there of holding that mass of people back. Uh, I want to uh, get to the next uh, slide there. I think that's pretty much the same. There is some transition there. But we were essentially two and a half miles here, two and a half to three miles this way, compacted in that hole in the donut, and the Germans were punching in and trying to get to us. Uh, when Hitler found out, and this, this came out of uh, those, those, those people in Bastogne told them to go to hell, he was furious. He demanded that the Germans wipe us out on Christmas morning. Mm -hmm. Christmas morning, going clear, and I'm in my uh, sleeping bag in a barn at that point, and uh, everybody was uh, running around with little tiny lights in the barn. Hey, get up, everybody get up. The Germans are coming. Well, they were coming all the time, but they're here, they're here. And I could hear diesel engines in the background. So I got out of my uh, sack real quick. I'm, dre I'm always dressed anyway, because it was so bitter cold, you have no idea uh, how cold we had at Bastogne. But uh, I threw my boots on, which were wet, always wet. And out we went with our guns. <clears throat> we, we actually took high ground near our command. And what happened at that, at that moment, uh, 321, that's where we were, right there. Can you see that little arrow? Uh, the Christmas morning attack came right here from the 77th Volk Sprinter Deer Group with tanks. They came right down in here, and they got only this far. Only got this far. I watched our tank, because I couldn't see, because they were below a defilade, a little valley. But our tank <coughs> destroyers knocked out six tanks, like in a matter of two minutes. It's unbelievable to see how how they did that. And the, that German attack, which was supposed to have come on in and wiped out Bastogne, stopped right in here. And then they had to go back. And uh, that, was quite a, that was quite a time. <clears throat> Let me just uh, take a moment and tell you uh, some of the uh, German outfits <clears throat> that were around us. Up in the northeast here, right here, we had the uh, second SS Das Reich Panzer Division. Right here was a second Panzer Lay. In fact, they were down in here too. Second uh, Panzer. Second uh, Panzer is an armored, another armored unit. Down here was the fifth. Here it is. Here the fifth Parachute Division. They had 901 Volksgrenadier Division right here. Over here was the uh, 560. That doesn't mean anything. I don't know what that means. Yet. But there's a 560th Volksgrenadier Division on this side. And right up here was the 15th Walsh Grenadier Division. And up here was the 77th uh, Panzer Gren Grenadiers. And on top was the 26th, uh, 26th Walsh Grenadier Division. We had elements of eight German divisions constantly pushing to get in. But uh, help. It was just uh, remarkable. Uh, the following day, on the 26th, <coughs> The 4th Armored Division came in from this area here. They penetrated our lines about 4.30 in the afternoon. <clears throat> and all we could hear were tank, uh, armored tank shells, our shells, their shells. 
tremendous racket, tremendous noise. But the 4th Armored broke in, but it was only just for tanks. Trucks wouldn't dare to do it. The Germans weren't too far away. But the thing is, it was broken. And that was a great, uh, a great feeling for our shape and everybody else. Uh, a little bit later, it was enlarged and opened up. Our, our supplies came in, our ammo, our food. Uh, I have to go back just quickly to something I forgot. On Christmas Eve, near where I was uh, standing, I was standing with about six guys next to a, a Sherman tank between two buildings, and it was around 4.30. The sun had just started to go down. It was getting dark. And in the, in the second war, we had what we called cerise panels. A cerise panel was a very brightly colored uh, plastic ID. Uh, the, our Air Force would see these cerise panels on the ground or on the uh, tanks or on any kind of equipment. They'd know that that's ours. If there's no cerise panel, get it, which means it would have been German. Well, I'm standing beside my tank eating off of a K ration. We only had one K ration a day. And uh, the, the, the Dutch people and our cooks always made very really hot water for our, our um, hot chocolate and also our um, broth that we had out of the K-ration box. And we're, we're standing there, and there's constant noise. You have no idea that when you're in this battle area, there's constant noise. You don't really pay attention to it. And we're standing there, and suddenly a tremendous rack, racket came right over our head. Here's a P-47 thinking that tank is German, and we're Germans. He's on a strafing run right down the road, and these 50 caliber slugs are going right over our head, going into a bunch of apple trees up at the end of the road on a bit of a hill. I heard this stuff flying over my head, and I looked, and I could see the branches on the trees going like this, and I ducked real quick, and we looked. And just that time, the P-47 went by us, and there's three more coming, so we dan I, I, I ran into the barn right next to me. There's a big barn there, and uh, they made their pass. They hit the tank a few times, but it didn't hit anybody. Planes went up like that and rolled over. And I came out and I looked up and I saw the splint end of a P-47 look right at us and I saw two bombs leave the wing. And I yelled to the guys, here come bombs. And I ran in, laid on the uh, floor between some cows. Because that's what was in there. I just dove, opened my mouth and closed my ears and waited. Well, the bombs uh, missed the barn and they hit a, 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 they hit a, a wagon full of manure. <laughs> That's a manure spreader. <laughs> they hit, a, they hit, a, they hit a, uh, a wagon load of manure, but the other three planes didn't bomb, so they must have seen that colored panel. And I thought that was maybe German pilots captured our planes and was coming after us. That's what I thought. Okay, that's that's an aside. I want to get that. Okay, now the Bastogne thing was coming to an end. It really didn't because more severe fighting happened between the December 28th and the July or January 15th because then the Germans and Hitler demanded again that they train all their attention to capturing Bastogne. They tried, but they didn't. And again, that's a, 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 great, uh, a great hand for the uh, airborne guys. They did a great job. After uh, middle of January, we headed south toward the Alsace area. And uh, again, the uh, Schaaf expected another push down around the uh, uh, Moselle Valley, and it didn't happen. We went down there just in case. So we were down there for about uh, two and a half, three weeks. There was some small, small uh, rifle fire. There was small uh, action down there. But after that was over, we actually you can you can raise raise that. We uh, went back to uh, our base camp at uh, Reims, and we were there again, getting new equipment, <coughs> new men, and uh, waiting for the next next mission. While we were there, on March 15, 45, uh, our entire 101st Airborne Division was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation. Uh, General McCall, General McCall, General Taylor were there, Eisenhower was there, Stephen Early, the, uh, one of uh, Roosevelt's uh, people, they were there to give us this particular citation because it was the first time ever that an entire division got that citation for what we did at Bastogne. <coughs> so that was quite a uh, quite a thing. And at that time, Eisenhower told everybody about uh, our great work in, in the ETO, and that they will be looking forward to using us in the Pacific. And there was <laughs> 12,000 guys went, oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot. 
Um, we were uh, we were leaving. We left the Reims area around the <coughs> latter part of March, 1945, and uh, we went up to the west side of the Rhine River, crossing Dusseldorf. Now, at that time, there were 350,000 German troops, pretty much in a big circle in what they called the Ruhr Pocket. And we held the western edge on the, uh, on the west side of the Rhine for, I really don't recall uh, how long, how, how, how far uh, uh, an area, I think it was about 15, 20 miles. But our whole division was there, and it was more or less a, a quiet time. Uh, while we were there, we were along the, uh, right at the Rhine, there, we had some fun. Uh, we had some fun with a German machine who was in a uh, he was in a uh, across the Rhine. The Rhine was about 200 yards wide. That's a massive river. And uh, one day, some of our a couple of our guys were walking between a house and a barn, and there's a big fence. It's about from here up to here, and it's open from here down. And uh, he was walking from the barn to the house, and just after he did that, a whole bunch of machine gun bullets flew right through that wooden door. And uh, we, we figured there's a guy across the river there <laughs> firing at us, and he didn't wait, he didn't do any firing until he saw somebody walking there. So we f figured out what we could do with him. We had nothing to do. We were we were just having some fun, and uh, we had a we had a lot of smoke shells that we did, that we uh, didn't need. So uh, we contacted our colonel and said, Can, do you mind if we try to knock off a machine gunner with, with our artillery with just one gun? He says, uh, go ahead. So, uh, so the idea was to get someone to run across from here to here while that guy, sh while that guy across the river shot, we would scope out and find out the muzzle blast and then we could pick him off and you could find him. Well, one guy said, I'll do it. So he ran, of course, by the time he ran, he got across the other side. But in the meantime, the German let loose and he missed him before because he was behind him. But after about three or four of those runs, this guy needed a medal for that. But after about three or four of those runs, we spotted the, the, uh, the muzzle blast on the other side and we put our glasses on it. And here there was a big sewer pipe under a road. And that guy was right in there, in that sewer pipe. And he was aimed right at our little place there. And he was having fun too. So we called the, we called the smoke shell. We, we, we got one gun on it, gave him the coordinates. We launched one the shell in and landed in the river between us and him. We, uh, we made a slight correction, 120 yards over, something like 15 to the right. These are very minute little things. And after the third shell, these are all smoke shells. We weren't going to expend a high explosive shell on him. And after the third shell, it landed right in the trees right around him. And we never heard from him again. He just, he must have packed up and took off. He knew we picked him off. We had him. But we had these little things that happened like that. Uh, kind of takes the boredom out of the day. <laughs> uh, following that, uh, we left that area. We got into 40 and 8s. 40 and 8s, that's a 40 and 8 railroad. 40 men, 8 horses. The French used that in the first war, then they did it in the second war. And in fact, these are the kind of cars that the uh, concentration camp inmates traveled to Auschwitz and all those places in. But we were in there. And this is a this is a half hour break on the way. But we took a 40 and 8 down to these train this train down to Olympic shopping. And we couldn't go any further because the railroad was destroyed. The, the, Air, the Air Force didn't leave too much. From then on we got into our army trucks and we went down the Neckar River, which is right at right at Heidelberg. We, dr we drove right up and then beautiful. This was eight, this is early April. We drove on down to Ulm, ULM, where the highest uh, steeple of a church in, the, in Europe is. And we were, went to the next town a little bit further called Landsberg. Uh, we hung out there for the night, and it was at that point you discovered that there was a concentration camp right outside of Landsberg. This is a concert. There's our Jeep. In fact, there's our Colonel walking back. But these are pictures I took. And this concentration camp uh, was awesome. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, thousands of people. It was just, to me, it was like hundreds. They, they did the same thing here as they did anywhere else. General Taylor was infuriated. He got all the people from, from Landsberg and made them, even with, even with caves, made them come out and walk by and, and bury them. 
Uh, he was just furious about that. And of course, the people had no idea this was going on. But uh, they came. And I just wanted you to see that this is some of the things that we see and that uh, happens. OK, after that, um, we left that area. We went down the uh, German Autobahn. And now it's getting into uh, mid, uh, around April 20th. And the German army was really capitulating. They were giving up in division by divisions. They were just giving up. As we went down, as we went down the Autobahn toward uh, Munich and also toward uh, the Tyrol, uh, there were thousands of Germans walking back between the Autobahn to the west. I just didn't know there were that many left, but there they were. And uh, we, we stayed one night at a, at a town, a German town called Maisbach. That was our evening stop. And we stayed in the barns and places like that. Sometimes we even took over homes and requisitioned them. But this, uh, this German uh, staff had the white flag out. And the, we, they were guarded at nighttime. And the next morning, they were all ordered out into the open uh, area of the, uh, of the courtyard. And for some reason or other, I was one of about 10 guys chosen to search him. And um, so it was interesting. Here's a, uh, the, strictly a, an airborne corporal, corporal searching, uh, searching uh, a line of Germans. And there were some officers there. And this, I'm, I'm a bit on the tall side. And this guy, uh, this officer, I never forgot him. He wouldn't look me in the eye at all. He was about this tall, no monocle, none of that. But he was very concrete face. He looked right past my shoulder and didn't bat an eye. And I eyeballed him until he looked at me and then he looked away. And I was searching him. He gave me his gun. This is it. And uh, I also got about eight more guns, which I stashed away. And uh, I sold them later in Paris. But uh, that's beside the point. And, uh, I got his gun and uh, he just gave it. He just took it off and gave it to me. And, uh, and he gave me his papers. And he had a, a pocket watch on his tongue right here. Well, all the guys are stealing stuff off these people like crazy. And he figured he's going to lose his pocket watch. So I t he didn't move. I just went with my finger and pulled it out and looked at it. And then he looked down and looked at me and looked away. And I, would, I opened that pocket watch. It was, a, it was a beauty. A lot of engraving, a lot of German script in there. And it brought my mind back to my dad. My dad has 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 a stopwatch. He's not living now, but he had a stopwatch, or a stopwatch, a pocket watch. And it was a beautiful thing. Like that. And I, I, I know how that, what that means to the family. And I looked at that. All I could, I could have easily gone like that. I looked at that. I had it opened. He was looking straight over my shoulder. He wasn't looking at me. I closed it and handed it back to him. With that, he looked at me. And there was a very slight movement in the mouth like this. That was it. I gave it back to him. I says, for who? So, so uh, it was interesting to make these searches. And uh, I often thought maybe I should have grabbed that, but I didn't. I thought better about it at the time. This is a pistol which I took from him. And it's obviously it's unloaded. It's an exact copy of our Army 45 caliber pistol. But this is a 32 caliber, 7.65 is, uh, is the number in here. Every piece of metal on here, this comes apart and is about five pieces. Every piece of metal here has got the swastika and the eagle stamp okay, on it. I was looking at this slide. And if you want to look at this later, I'll hold it for you. I don't want oh, you to I touch see. it. Yeah. But uh, this, is the, this is the real stuff right here. It's a great gun. The, uh, then we went on down the next day. Went on down to a town called Bad Reichenhall, which was at the, uh, the beginning of the Tyrolean Alps. Absolutely beautiful. About 10 or 12 miles further down this wavy road, we got into Berchtesgaden, Hitler's hideout. Now, the rumor was that the uh, Schaeff ordered us to, to Berchtesgaden because we had no idea where Hitler was or any of his cohorts. We had no idea he was in the bunker in Berlin because nobody knew. They thought maybe he would be down there to hold up and fight to the death because he had a he had a regiment of SS troopers, all six footers plus, who were going to defend him to the death. So that's why the 101 went there, as, as I as I understand it. Uh, as it turned out, when we got into the town of Birch's Garden, uh, the the women and children left the street. They weren't around anywhere. You couldn't find them. It so happens that the Goebbels, the propaganda minister, 
he told the German people months and months and months before that the American paratroopers are really outlaws, rapists, burglars, bandits, and they got them out of prison if they had volunteered to be in the airborne. So don't ever open your doors to any paratrooper, anybody with, that's in that airborne. So they thought we were going to rape the town. But we didn't care because we couldn't fraternize. Uh, we had a restriction. You couldn't fraternize with Germans. Just not, we weren't supposed to do that. So we didn't pay any attention to them. It's, you couldn't find the people. After about the first day or so, they started coming out and looking around. And then we requis requisitioned some of their homes. And uh, they didn't say a word. They said, oh, yes, we'll, we'll leave. So uh, we, we took their homes and, uh, and we, we promised not to damage them. And really, the guys, I don't think, did. And um, then we got the uh, Germans asking if they would like to work in our kitchens, KP. Well, they thought that would be a good idea, and they all did. And there was more, there was more kitchens help out around there, and you could shake a stick out because we gave them good food. They didn't have a whole lot of food. And uh, so that was how that ended up. We all went up to the hideout that was up the mountain. And that fellow Hitler had a fantastic spot. Here it is. Here's his uh, chalet, his Berghof, before, before the before the war. And uh, on April 25th, the RAF had a mission to come here and blast this whole place because they thought he might be here. And they did a fantastic job. They uh, they dropped blockbusters, 30, 40 feet diameter holes in the mountain, looked like a moonscape. And uh, I have some other pictures here. These are a picture I took. That's the same house. There's a blockbuster landed right on the other side of his chalet. Now what the SS did, what didn't get destroyed by the bombs, they set it on fire. They set Hitler's house on fire. It didn't totally all burn. Goering's house, which was up the road a little bit, was all wood. They didn't touch that with the smoke. It burned like crazy. And uh, so we all went up here, and I have another picture or two of uh, another angle. You might have seen the days when Hitler used to walk down these steps with Mussolini and other people. That's, that's, that's what's left of the uh, Berghof. And uh, I spent about three days all through here grabbing stuff. He, he, had a, he had a library. I got documents up here that date back to 1921. I took out of his library. I had uh, some some other things I picked up. Everybody was picking things up. And uh, I went to Goering's house. I got some things out of Goering's house, a book or two, and some other things. I've got a lot of nice things if you'd like to look at them, but I just wanted to let you know that. Now, one last thing. VE Day came along, March or May 8th, and we had a great, great uh, uh, arrangement there where the whole division celebrated VE Day. And uh, that VE Day night, our guys, well, that's, well, that's my outfit, right? That's part one. Are you there? I'm the young man holding. So this is actually headquarters battery, and there's more of it there on the other side. But uh, uh, that night, VE Day night, uh, we had a bunch of guys on the second floor. We had about 10 people in this house. They decided to have a party. And uh, there's about three guys and myself who uh, who went went to bed on the third floor in our sleeping bags. And uh, around midnight, we went to bed and really sacked out. Below us, on the second floor, these guys were having a hell of a time. They were drinking beer, and had the 45 out, and they're oh, no. right through the ceiling. And they, kept, they shot about five rounds through the ceiling, and we're up there. <laughs> One guy says, hey, wait a minute. There's guys upstairs sleeping. Oh, the hell they are. They're downstairs. No, they're upstairs. So they quick ran up. Five of us were lying there. One guy finally woke up and didn't know what the noise was, but he didn't know there was bullet holes in the floor. I'll tell you, it's a, it's, it's a matter of luck. Sometimes you get back on these things. But uh, So that's pretty much my uh, my trip through there. The, uh, after, the, after that, we uh, went, went back to England. I went back to France. I was on a furlough in England around the middle of the early part of August 45, and I was on a train, and uh, the Brits were getting on. I was going up to Edinburgh, and the Brits were getting on telling me about, telling us all about this massive bomb that uh, destroyed an entire Japanese city. One bomb. I said, oh, okay, that's not possible. You know, again, 21 years old. And they, they said, yes, a massive bomb, an atom bomb, 
destroy a Japanese city. And I said, how's that possible? Of course, I didn't know. And when I got to Edinburgh, I found out we had an atom bomb, and I didn't know anything about it, but uh, seven days later, they uh, reminded the Japs they better surrender. They hit Nagasaki. But uh, that ended the war, and that was great news for us because I think we were destined to go there with many other people. So that was the end of that. Uh, the, uh, the entire ad uh, 101st Airborne Division, we got all kinds of awards. Uh, we, uh, we actually call it our battle five, four bronze battle stars. We got arrowhead, a bronze arrowhead is for an aerial assault. And the Dutch, here's my uh, World War II Eisenhower jacket. The Dutch uh, gave us the uh, Order of the Orange. It's an orange lanyard for what we did in Holland. Here's the Belgian Farger. Now the Farger is given to those who qualify to have they have two Belgian quadrigars. That entitles us to have one Farger. This is for that's for Bastogne and also the invasion of the Normandy. So that's about my uh, my delivery. I hope you enjoy that. Now, if you have time, how, how do you do? Well, we have time. We need to get you out of here to eat so you can come back and start all over again. But we've got about 15 minutes until we all have everybody cleared out. I'm, I, don't, I don't need anything to eat. I saw a hand back here. Rex? Right. Oh, right. How, how'd, you, how'd you get all your goodies home? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just for a moment. Sorry about that. This is a picture I took at Maastricht. This is U.S. Cemetery in the southeastern Holland. I took that picture in 19... Uh, in 1964. The people in Europe take fantastic care of our cemeteries. <laughs> and when you're here, you walk among it's, 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 a, it's an awesome feeling. Those are the heroes. That's right. Thanks very much. You can turn that on. How'd you get all your goodies home? Oh, hey, there's always a way. I know that. I'll tell you how I got them home very quickly. C ration boxes are the best boxes to ship things home in. So K rations. K rations, yes. That's right. Somebody I else see. has a question. Let's put it on the mic so that we get it on the tape. I'll, I'll uh, okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is what I do since the Second World War. That's another book. <laughs> But anyway, uh, I, went to, I went two years to a college in Philly, the commercial art school, and uh, uh, I, uh, married, I met Mary Elaine in 1950. Bless and I, was, uh, I started my own advertising promotion business in 1953. Next year is my 50th year. And I'm still working as a lone eagle. I'm not, I'm not, there's only one person doing it, that's me. Elaine does my books and she does that, but I do everything else. Uh, I have a son and daughter. My daughter, I think, will be here tonight, and uh, he's an airline pilot, and she's a uh, gal who works at a title company, and um, I've done other things, a lot of hobbies and so forth. Granted. Uh, have you ever jumped out of an airplane? Granted, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yes, if I ever jumped out of an airplane. Well, that was 1945, but uh, I don't want to get into that because this discussion is about the veterans in World War II. I've been a skydiver since 1963. I jump out of airplanes for fun. I do formation fly flying. I jumped in Holland a number of times after the war, uh, 50th anniversary, etc. I've jumped with the, in the presence of Prince Bernhard, Queen Juliana's husband, the father of uh, Queen Beatrix. Uh, I jump generally every week down to Williamstown, New Jersey with my daughter. And I had the pleasure of jumping with uh, President George Bush in 1999 in Houston. I've got some of those pictures here if I can guess if you want to see some of that. Any other questions? B. Have you ever contributed any of your experiences to the movie industry? Oh, no. The question was, did I ever give any of my experiences to the movie industry? No. 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 I'll let that up, let that up to Spielberg and folks like that. They, they do a very good job. They did a very good job. There was a question here, I think. Yes. Yeah. Have you said Monroe? That's, that's Mark Roberts. By the way, Mia is a Dutch lady who's my age. She was a little girl 
I think you're all 19. When we went into Eindhoven, come on. She lived about 30 minutes from Eindhoven. 